I've written down add a last term to complete the square. And my first partial trinomial is x squared plus 16x. So I want to know what am I going to add here on the end so that this becomes a perfect square trinomial. Well, I take half of this number, half of 16 is 8, and square it. That gives me 64. Now, x squared plus 16x plus 64 is the binomial x plus 8 quantity squared. So, if my leading coefficient is 1, and I want this to be a perfect square trinomial, I look to the coefficient of the middle term. If I take half of it and square the result, I get this number right here to add on, and that makes this a perfect square trinomial. Then that is the binomial x plus 8 quantity squared, where this 8 is the square root of this number 64. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. You can check it. The square of x is x squared. The square of 8 is 64. If I multiply these together, I get 8x times 2 is 16x. So you can see that x plus 8 quantity squared is this trinomial right here. Let's try it on the next problem. y squared minus 8y. I go to the coefficient of the middle term. It's 8. I take half of that. That's 4. Square it, and I get 16. So if I add 16 on here, I know I've got a perfect square trinomial, which factors into y minus 4 quantity squared. So first of all, I have to have a leading coefficient of 1. If that's the case, I go to the coefficient of the middle term. I take half of it, in this case that's 4, square it, getting 16, and that gives me a perfect square trinomial, which I know will factor like this. Okay, let's look at one last one to do right here. Uh, x squared plus 7x, where I get a number that's not divisible by 2 evenly. It still can be written as a perfect square trinomial. First of all, the leading coefficient is 1, so I move to the coefficient of the middle term. Half of 7 is 7 halves. It's just that easy. The square of which is 49 fourths. So if I add on here 49 fourths, I know I'm going to have a perfect square trinomial. What does it factor into? It factors, as all the rest of them have, into x plus, not 49 fourths, but 7 halves. So x plus 7 halves quantity squared is this number right here. Now, let's just check that real quick and see. The square of x is x squared. The square of 7 halves is 49 fourths. If I multiply these two together, I get 7 halves x. Double that, I get 2 times 7 halves x, which is 7x. So I get the correct middle term. So if I square this binomial right here, I do in fact get this trinomial. But these are the hardest ones to work with when this number, this coefficient of x right here is not an even number. It's not divisible evenly by 2. But notice that you can still complete the square on that polynomial. Okay, let's go now to a quadratic equation and see if we can apply this principle to solve it. I have x squared minus 6x equals 16. Well, I want to solve this for x. And I'm going to do it by completing the square. So what I'm going to do is write this as x squared minus 6x. And then I'm going to leave myself some room right here equals 16. Now, I want to complete the square on the left side. So I want to add an appropriate term right here so that this left side becomes a perfect square trinomial. So what I'm going to add, first of all, I notice that that coefficient is 1, so I move to this term. Half of 6 is 3, the square of which is 9. So I'm going to add 9 onto the left side of this equation. The addition property of equality tells me I must do the same thing to the other side, or I'll change the solution to the equation. Now, the left side is the binomial x minus 3, quantity squared, and the right side is the perfect square 25. So look what I've done. I've taken this quadratic equation right here, added the appropriate term onto it to turn the left side of it into a perfect square trinomial, do the same thing to the other side. That allows me to take this perfect square trinomial and write it as the square of this binomial. Now this equation has the form of the equations we solved previously in the last section where we used our theorem to take the square root of both sides. The solution from this, this point on matches exactly the solutions to the equations we had in the previous section. So if x minus 3 squared is 25, then x minus 3 itself is plus or minus the square root of 25, which is 5. 
adding 3 to both sides, I get x equal 3 plus or minus 5. That will give me 3 plus 5, which is 8 for one solution, and x equal 3 minus 5, which is negative 2, for the other solution. So here I have two solutions, 8 and negative 2. Now, what I want to show you is that I could have solved this original equation by factoring and get these same two solutions just to convince you that this method works. So I'm just going to go right down here and solve this equation again real quickly. x squared minus 6x equals 16. Okay, to solve this equation, I would put it in standard form by adding negative 16 to both sides. This is my old method of solution by factoring. To factor this, x squared minus 6x minus 16, it factors into x minus 8 times x plus 2. Set x minus 8 equal to 0, and I get the solution x equal 8. Set x plus 2 equal to 0, and I get the solution x equal negative 2. So here are, you can see, my same two solutions that I got by doing this completing the square method. Now you might ask, well, why go to all this trouble of completing the square when I could have just factored this equation and got these solutions anyways? The point is this. Not all quadratic equations factor. This completing the square method allows you to solve any quadratic equation, whether it's factorable or not. In this case, we solve using completing the square. We get two nice solutions, 8 and negative 2. That tells us that the original equation was, in fact, factorable. But we don't always know that. Some equations are factorable, some are not. If they're not factorable, we need another method of solving them, and this completing the square method always works.